Welcome to the Lee Schools TV podcast. I'm Adam Wright with Lee Schools TV. Joining us on the podcast today is Patty Loverock, reading coach Dunbar High School. Patty, thanks for being here today. Thank you. Uh, I'm pumped for this podcast because you have a very interesting uh, backstory, and we're going to get into all that. You're, you're a 2007 Golden Apple recipient, uh, just to mention. And we first met when I was at Dunbar High School a few weeks back. I was doing a story on the International Center uh, about the some great things that Dunbar High School is doing to help students from other countries assimilate and learn English there at Dunbar High School. We'll talk about that later in the podcast. But I also wanted to talk about uh, the fact that you were an Olympic athlete in the 70s. Yes, I was. For Canada. You grew up in Canada, and we'll talk about that in a second. You were a track runner, mm-hmm. and for you were in the 1976 Olympic Games in Montreal. Uh, yes, I was. So before we talk about that, which is really cool, let me just ask you, what's the origin of your last name, Love Rock? That is an interesting last name, and it is an excellent last name to have in high school, to deal with high school students and have that name. Uh, My father was born in Burton-upon-Trent, which is a city in England, and that was his last name. And uh, culturally, in Canada, where I'm married to uh, an American, but I am Canadian, I have dual citizenship, uh, women don't change their last name when they get married, many of us. So that is my maiden name, and it is my family name, and it... I'm, I, susp- I suspect along the way there were some jewelers or something, but it, we don't have any that I know of. So it's a, it's a common last name in, in England? Very common yeah. last name in England. And what people here in this part of the country, I believe there's a restaurant called Laverox. Yeah. And there used to be one down by Fort Myers Beach. And at that time, I received many calls requesting reservations. <laughs> That's funny. Um, what would you tell people? I would tell them the wrong name, and I actually had the phone number for the restaurant. So Kept just, it handy. Well, you know, we have to keep Lee County friendly, yeah. right? Uh, well, it's a cool last name. Thank uh, you. All right, so you were in the 1976 Summer Olympic Games in Montreal. You were you ran the 100-meter, 200-meter, and the 4-by-100-meter relay. Correct. Mm-hmm. How... Well, actually, before we get to that, what was it like growing up in Canada? Where, where did you grow up in Canada? I grew up in, uh, primarily in a beautiful small town on Vancouver Island called Courtney. And um, I lived there for many years, and it was idyllic. It was everything that you, um, that, that you can think small town living would be. Um, so for people who aren't familiar where with is can- that? Canadian geography in relation to maybe some U.S. cities, where is that? Um, Courtney, British Columbia. Anybody that's ever taken a cruise ship into Vancouver will be familiar with Vancouver Island. But for those who haven't, you uh, imagine where Seattle is and you drive about two and a half hours north, okay. come to Vancouver, British Columbia. Then you take a two and a half hour ferry boat ride to Vancouver Island, and then you drive three hours and you get to the town in which I was a child. So it's a haul. A very small town? <laughs> At that time that I lived there, the main industry was logging. And I find it so interesting when I'm teaching because that's a word I have known. I'm going to guess it was one of the first words I ever learned. But children who go up here, I always have to explain that logging is cutting down trees and turning them into lumber. Mm-hmm. That was the main industry, and fishing. And there were only about 3,000 people there. And my sister and I had just a great life. You know, stay outside and play till the streetlights went off. And I mean, just wonderful. Was your your dad a logger or? No, my dad um, was actually a real estate salesman. But, um, and my mom worked Mm -hmm. um, for uh, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police as a secretary. Cool. Yeah, it was a a great life, really. And so... You know, people listening to this, we're in Florida, and they, a lot of us, especially me, I can't imagine what the winters were like there. And so having lived in Florida for many years now, and then growing up in Canada, what are the the winters like? I will summarize it for you. Um, Because of my age, when people hear my age, they often comment that I have really good skin, to which I reply, when you grow up in a place where it rains 300 days a year, and you never are exposed to the sun. And you know, you have to understand that you just get used to it. Mm. And now I live here, there is not, I was driving here and thinking, 
man, this weather is great. Mm-hmm. And I, and it really, truly, I never take it for granted. Yeah. When you grow up under cloudy skies, now the West Coast does not have snow. They, it mm-hmm. primarily is rain. Okay. Yeah. On the very West Coast of Vancouver. Gotcha. It's a rainforest, mm. a cold rainforest. Uh, what kind of... What kind of student were you growing up? I was a pretty good student. Um, I say the pretty good part. I'm, I was a, a bit of, uh, and it helps me now, because I was a person who would get in trouble for shouting out answers. You know, school back then, you were expected to be very, I mean, there were 50 kids in the classroom, and those teachers ruled were baby boomers, right? Every classroom was packed. One of the schools I went to, though, was so so interesting. I got in a lot of trouble for yelling out answers in this school. And um, I, it helps me as a teacher now. It was grades K to 4, hmm. one-room schoolhouse wow. in a little town called Bowser. But the reason I think my experience of being kind of a questioning pain in the you-know-what student, which is pretty much what I was like. And I was very competitive. Like if those answers didn't come fast enough, I shot up out of my seat and I yelled it out, which got me in a lot of trouble. When children are like that in my class, I understand them. Mm. I comp- I never get impatient. I just have a little chat with them because I was that kid. So you went on to become an Olympic athlete. When did your love of sports come into play? Well, I have a great deal of energy and my mother encouraged me to, my, our mother, my sister, who also lives in Fort Myers, we both at an early age got involved in local track meets. And both of us were very talented. We had a real talent. And um, my sister, um, w- w- I, I continued to get bigger and stronger. She's quite diminutive, so she did not keep up the speed that I grew. And I'm five inches taller than she is. Mm-hmm. For whatever reason, and so we, it, it, when you're in a, we were big fish in little in a little pond, and you get a lot of feedback. I'm going to tell you my first race. I was running and winning races when I was six years old, and you start to get accolades, and it just feeds on itself. Mm-hmm. It's it was it was just really a very rewarding. Um, it was rewarding, but at the same time, it was at times viewed as weird back then. <laughs> so. Uh... Briefly, I guess, how, how does one go from winning races at six years old to being in the a star on the Canadian Olympic team? Yeah, You know what it comes down to? And it's true today as it was then, a good coach. I had a fantastic small town coach, both at the junior high school and a local guy who just coached our little track team. The, and my mom drove my sister and I to track meets as much as she could, recognizing we had talent. And when I moved to Vancouver in the 11th grade, that coach I had put me in touch with a national coach in Vancouver who said, she's got talent, but she needs good coaching. And I joined that club and never looked back. Mm -hmm. So it was coaches guiding me along the way. And my mother being willing to drive my sister and I to track meets and sit on freezing cold benches weekend after weekend after weekend. And I know you went on to study uh, journalism I did. in college, or did you call it university? Yeah. <laughs> um, do you, I'm, I'm sure you were also, did you get a, an athletic scholarship? Where'd you go to? My university? undergraduate degree mm-hmm. is from the University of British Columbia. And to answer your question, which is a very good question, no, this was, uh, even to this day, Canadian universities do not give athletic scholarships except for one or two who are connected to the American system. Mm. But there were no U.S. scholarships available because, of course, this was 1971 to 72 to 73. I graduated in 76. Mm -hmm. For my bachelor, there was no Title IX. There was, you know, I once, in 1972... The weather was so bad in Vancouver that five of us came down to UCLA to use their track to prepare for the the season. We were 18, 19-year-olds. We had a place we could stay in, and UCLA would not let us run 
on their track because we were girls. Wow. We had to take the bus to USC, which was a private college, and would permit us to run on their track. Hmm. True story. Wow. Yeah. Such a shame. Different time back then. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and you said uh, to this day, you're you're still the only person in your family uh, to earn a college degree, right? I am. And so, how? What I did? You asked that question, which I I'll, I will now answer. School back then, and millennials will tell you this, was very inexpensive. I think the sum total of my tuition when I went to school was $1,200 a year. So it wasn't expensive. I had little part-time jobs, and I was able to pay for it. Now, in 1975, when Canada was going to get the Olympics, the Canadian Olympic Association started to giving, giving those of us who had a chance of doing well stipends. So we would get $5,000 a year. And that was enough back then to get me through. And so I did get that undergraduate degree. And then um, in the ensuing couple of years before I retired from track in 1978, I worked and ran. I was able to balance both. Mm -hmm. So you you make your way on to the Canadian Olympic team. Mm -hmm. Um, Was that uh, difficult or it's very it, it, that's a good question my first national team was actually 1970 okay i made it the national team when i was in the 11th grade so yeah you were only 16 17 yeah, years yeah. old i made the national team i won the 200 and was second in the 100 meters for the nation at that time and um and i think about that now i think about what would that be like but i didn't even i just sort of expected i would do that and moved on um and went and for so for between 1970 and 1978, I was on the national team, but making the Olympic team and doing, in my estimation, very well in the Olympics, uh, you, you know, for for the level of my running, um, was absolutely an honor. I mean, I think anybody that gets to run in the Olympics in their home country is very fortunate, and I'm one of those people. So you get to Montreal for for the opening ceremonies of the 76 Summer Olympics. What was that like? Well, what they don't tell you when you watch those opening ceremonies is that you have actually spent three to four hours outside the stadium in a big line. (laughs) That sounds fun. you wait, and you wait, and you wait. And then there's that magic moment which brings tears to my eyes to this day. And I'm sure every athlete will say the same, no matter what country they're from when the cheer rises up and as you walk in the stadium. But, of course, it was in Canada, so it was very, very moving. Tremendous sense of patriotism at that moment? Yes, and also a sense of accomplishment, Mm -hmm. very much so, being very pleased to be there representing the country. Did you have a lot of time to meet and talk to athletes from all over the world? You know, Adam, I often get that question, and I I don't want to burst anyone's bubble, but... When you are in the Olympics, especially, think about it. I was a sprinter. Yeah. It's a very self-centered sport. Mm-hmm. And you're, you're only thinking about yourself. People are very focused. Mm-hmm. I have always noticed at, you know, when I'm in any athlete's village, that the team sports are way friendlier. Mm. <laughs> I guess that makes sense. Yeah. But the individual athletes, mm. they are all into their own heads. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we actually found some old video from oh, my goodness. 76 on YouTube of the, it's the best quality version we could find, um, of the, of it two, the 100 meter quarterfinal race oh, yes, that you're that is, in. Yeah. So mm-hmm. let's watch it real quick and maybe you can give us some play by play. Sure. Um, okay. So we'll bring it up and if you could just maybe take us through. So you're lining up. So this is my this is actually my favorite part. That's you in the red yeah, shorts, in, number six. Yeah. Actually sixty seven, I think 67, it is. Sixty seven, okay. Can't see it, okay. I think. Anyway, um you you know it's really exciting because you know the gun is going to go and you're so focused. It's just the most exquisite feeling. It really is. And you're in lane four, I believe. Mm-hmm. And there's my start, which mm-hmm. was pretty good. And here come the, um, that's Anagret Richter from um, 
West Germany and a Jamaican and the East German and then me. And this was the race that wow. got me into the semifinal. And that's it, you right there in the background. Right there in the background behind Annegret Richter, yes, from West Germany. And it was a, and I was pleased with my time. I believe it was eleven point five because the it was a muggy day. And at that point, my best time was 11.34. So I, was, I wanted to get into the semifinal, and I did. And so who, who else was in this race that you were competing against? Did you know much about them? I'm sure oh, you did. Oh, I did. Yeah. Uh, just about everybody in the race had previously beaten me So in other events. So I, was vi I knew I was up against it. And here it is in, in slow-mo. Oh, slow motion. My yeah. goodness. Um, but there is uh, certainly the uh, Isaac Amova from um, Russia is in the far outside lane. She had beaten me um, two years previously in a race, and we had quite a fierce competition going on. There's um, a, a young woman named Helen from Scotland who had beaten me at the Commonwealth Games. And um, the, um, I had defeated the East German the year before, uh, but I, for some reason, I don't know why, she just had her game on a little bit better than I did. But the other three people behind me, I had never beaten them before. Congratulations. Yeah, so I was pleased about that. that. I looked at that semifinal and thought, uh-oh. <laughs> so then you get to the semifinal, and, and, and what happens? Oh, semifinal, I yeah. came fifth. Okay. I believe I came fifth, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which, you, which you only the top four top make four the final. Top four go on, yeah. yeah. And so you also competed in the 200-meter and the 4-by-100-meter relay. And so how did Canada do? Um, in the 200, again, I was a semifinalist, mm -hmm. but I did run a personal best. Uh, so I was very pleased about that because that's what you have to hope for that you run your best, and that record stood for a while. But our 4 by 100 meter relay team, you have to understand that <clears throat> there were three, two girls on that team that could, were not fast, and they ran out of, the, I mean, they ran right out of their own feet. They were so fantastic. The, uh, myself and the other woman, we ran personal bests, I'm sure of it, just for the 100 meters, and we were fourth, um, by eight one hundredths of a second, and it's interesting that that Russian whom I beat in the semifinal was their last leg against our person. Mm -hmm. So she really had a head of steam on because at that time, the Russians were not supposed to be beaten by the Canadians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we ran uh, f uh, a forty three seventeen, which was a Canadian record for almost twenty years. Wow. Yeah, it was a Commonwealth record for a long time, but. It, for almost 20 years, I think it was broken in 2014. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And I know that there are some questions back then about whether some of those other teams were maybe doping or taking part in I'm some sorry, stuff. We, we, don't, we don't have to get into that or anything. Yeah. Um, but what, do uh, you have any other cool, interesting stories from just being in the Olympics? Um, yes. I, I think um, the, the most wonderful part of it for me was... Um, Although it was, av for me, it taught me as a person how to set a goal. This is something you hear all the time and to keep your eye on it and to not give up because along the way, there are going to be injuries. There's, there are going to be losses and you learn from those as much as you do the wins. And that has helped me so much working with young athletes and working with students, um, you learn resilience. Mm -hmm. You And that is a word that became so popular in the last couple of years. I think there's books. But resilience is a quality that you learn by being an Olympic athlete. Mm -hmm. And you, you told me the other day that you think that student athletes are underestimated. Completely. I think student athletes are incredibly de dedicated human beings. They have a level of bravado that seems to be required now. They have their presentation, both male, males and females. But when you really talk with them and you see the level of their passion about their sport and their willingness to work these long school hours and practice, they are very, they are inspirational. You do have to sometimes explain they are children. Think about yourself, Adam, when you were 17. Did you not make some boneheaded comments I know I did. Sure. And they are children. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that bravado leads them mm -hmm. to say things that others view as rude. And all you have to do is take them aside and explain how they're supposed to act.
And, you know, you can get in so much trouble today, especially, you know, in the Twitter world we live in, where yes. you have high school students tweeting some, you know, dumb stuff out sometimes. And then years later, there's an article written about it and to try to, you know, I often have thought of that. Excuse me. I absolutely agree. And I think young kids have so much pressure now because of social media. Mm -hmm. It's, it's completely different than it was for me. Yeah. That's a, sometimes a recurring theme on, on this show is social media and how much different the lives of our, you know, students in the district now, and, you know, especially teenagers and middle school students, just the way they have to navigate their social life nowadays is so much different than, than, you know, when we had to, and when we were in school. You know, we could, you, and you may have done it, although I did check. I don't know if you've done a podcast on social media. Did I? I, We have not dedicated an entire podcast to social media, but we've discussed it in, in segments on a few different podcasts. Yeah. What I will tell you that I noticed, which is new to me, is this almost affect of blankness on, on, of teenage pres- uh, emotional presentation. And I, I don't want to generalize, but I do see it. Um, and I think it's because they are so um, subjected to having their picture taken. I mean, mm. for lack of a better description. I mean, I'll I have a good time and smile and laugh and kid around because I have, you know, I have no experience with having a negative experience on Twitter or Facebook. I did get rid of my Facebook many, many years ago because I did not want to be party to maybe seeing a post I didn't want to see. Yeah. So I got rid of it. Mm-hmm. Um, is there any social media that you that yes. you really like? I have. I do like Instagram. Okay. And even though I know it's owned by Facebook, I yeah. believe. I do like Instagram, and I have a grand total of uh, nine followers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if you want to follow her on Instagram... I'm sure you can find her. Uh, so is there anything else you wanted to talk about uh, about the Olympics before we move on? Um, no, just okay. I really encourage kids in... Do uh, you know, one thing I will say, Lee County needs to watch for Olympic track and field athletes in their future. This initiative by the district to finally put in beautiful new tracks at these high schools, you wait and see, because our kids are so good and they are basically running on bus ramps that have lines on them. Mm. When they get a real track, you wait. And thank you to Dr. Atkins for that initiative because that is going to change lives. Having decent tracks in our high schools is great. Um, actually, one thing I just thought of that I want to ask you about is, and this is something that I've, I kind of think about every time there's an Olympics on, is what do you think of the Olympics nowadays compared to to back then because I find them when I was little I you know loved watching the Olympics every every two years you know summer and winter would come on and I was glued to the TV for two weeks and I guess part of it was probably just the novelty of you know being young and not having experienced too many Olympics before but now that there's you know events on like six different channels that you can watch which is great because you get to expose you get exposed to so many different uh, events that you might not have been able to see or that they didn't really focus on too much in the past. But uh, the fact that the results come out, you, like you can, you can because of different time zones, you might, there might be an event at 4 a.m. while you're sleeping and then you can get on the internet, you can find out the winners of the events before they're even aired on TV. And I feel like that kind of takes away from it a little bit. And it's like, well, I already know who won. Why would I tune in to watch kind of thing? Well, just what's your... Thoughts certainly has been my experience mm-hmm. and I usually only um, watch them um, it's probably tape delay given the time change, yeah but I don't read the results mm-hmm. and I do watch it just like you you know just like we used to watch them yeah and it, and it really was a family event I mm-hmm. remember it it was a family event and and you'd all sit around and you'd watch the gymnastics and the basketball but I'm gonna tell you I think the good thing is the new platforms and um, have given exposure mm. to many sports that nobody watched. I mean, nobody wanted to watch badminton unless they were from an Asian country where it's Exciting. very popular. Yeah. And it's fabulous. Badminton is a great sport. Tell me that you would ever even think about watching a curling match. Yeah, there's just like, it's kind of like a, it's got a, like a cult following it nowadays. Does. And so I agree that that, and that is a good question. Yeah. But I do, when it comes to the 100-meter final for men and women, 
it, it, when the Olympics are on, I don't read the results. Yeah, I guess I, you can stay away from it and I avoid do. it if you try hard. I do. Um, okay, so you went. So you got a. You went on to get a master's degree in journalism. Mm -hmm. And where did you go to grad school? I went to, um, when I graduated from, with my undergraduate degree, I worked for two years, had a very good job, and then decided I wanted to um, work in sports reporting. I thought I wanted to work in sports reporting. I went to the University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario, and got a master's in journalism. Their program now is, of course, called Media Communications because it's changed so much. Mm -hmm. Back then, it was print and radio and television only. Mm -hmm. And I had a wonderful life. I worked for the local paper, the London uh, Free Press, and I was a sports reporter for them very briefly and um, met my husband, and we, and we moved to California. And I got out of sports reporting because I... Um, I I had been doing everything on the weekends and as an athlete for decades, it felt like. And health and fitness coverage was a more tolerable schedule for me. So I went to covering. That was when the fitness craze started. Like Jane Fonda, and you mentioned. And Jazzercise and all of that. Mm -hmm. And I would cover it and interview people. It's probably when, is that around the same time like Richard Simmons was Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and my main employer was um, Shape Magazine, okay. which is still... Available on the newsstands, and you moved. So you moved to California in 1980. No, yes, said. 1980. Yeah, and you worked uh, as a health and fitness Writer. journalist for how many years? Or of and all and the whole time I was yeah. there, we moved here in 1994, so 14 years. Okay. Yeah. So what brought you to uh, Lee County? My sister lived here, and we had a. We finally had a little girl who's now 27. Mm -hmm. And uh, we thought, eh, we love Los Angeles and we've had a good life here. But, you know, a smaller community might be better for raising a child. Mm -hmm. Most of the people, uh, many, many people send their children to private school in Los Angeles. But I am a big supporter of public schools. And I had read such good things about Lee County School District. It was so interesting to me. I would get the local paper, and there would be stories about all the things Lee County School District, School District of Lee County is doing this, doing that, right? Mm -hmm. You could dig to page 15 of the Los Angeles Times before you would find anything mm -hmm. about the schools. And I thought, hmm. And my sister lived here, so we moved here. Uh, so you moved here in 95, you said? 95. Mm -hmm. Did you fall in love with the area right away? Did it take a little bit of time? We moved here in September, mm -hmm. and I immediately yeah. found out I had many allergies I did not know I had, which is very funny because <laughs> they just have so many things that bloom here. And But then what we loved was um, the, being able to go to the beach so easily and... Um, and just uh, and it's the south. Yeah, it's very friendly mm -hmm. compared to Los Angeles, and the pace. Oh, we loved it. Yeah, well, talk about just how much this area has changed over the past twenty-five years, almost. It has really changed. Yeah. The schools have gotten better. The schools have gotten, I think, much more sophisticated. You think about some of the initiatives that we have. Um, our daughter's first school was Gateway Elementary. I had a she had a great experience. And, um, but then I started to think, you know, I needed to be in the profession. So when she was in the third grade, I went into teaching. So you, so your first job when you moved here, you said you worked for Sony. I sure did. In Gateway. <laughs> doing what? Well, I worked at Sony taking customer calls for people who are unhappy with their Sony electronic <laughs> answering machines, um, anything audio, telephones, and with my personality, I, I mean, I just loved it. I mean, these, oh. it was so interesting and getting to talk to people. I just loved it. I loved it. And they, in fact, eventually promoted me to the part where the people were so angry they had called to Tokyo. And then it would come back to, to there's a group of 10 of us at Gateway, and it would come back to us. Get, so Tokyo would send them to us. And those were some interesting calls let me tell you how long did you do that i did it for about a year, about a year. That's so all. you said okay so you said your daughter had a big part to do with why you moved into education so mm -hmm. let's talk about that what what made you other than maybe wanting to you know work in the same district where your daughter was going to school but how does one go from olympic athlete health and fitness journalist then working for sony and then and then getting into the school system the school district at the time it was um 2000 
had, uh, believe it or not, Lee County Schools, um, they were, I guess like now, they were desperate for teachers. And what happened is I had taught in Canada for one year in uh, an elementary school. Um, and, and I had a degree in, it's called recreation education. I had the degree that allowed me to work. And then because things of my, uh, you, you can't be an athlete and, and work as a teacher. It's impossible. So when I came here, I did get my Florida certification. And um, I saw with school choice at the time was a lottery. Like they actually pulled your name out of, it was a physical name pulling. And I honestly realized that if you were in the system, you could direct your child's schools a little better. So I went to be a substitute teacher and at Fort Myers Middle. I loved the location. I loved the school. I thought the principal was great. Louise Hollins was the principal. And she sat down with me and she said, you have a head on your shoulders. I want you to leave Sony and come and work here. <laughs> I said, okay. So you said Fort Myers Middle? Fort Myers Middle. I was there. That was your first full-time teaching job? Full first, a full-time teaching job to uh, November of 2000. And um, I'll tell you, they, I was their third teacher and it was November. So it will tell you something about those seventh graders <laughs> and they are still some of my favorite kids. Yeah. They really are. So what did you teach? I Fort? taught English. English. I'm English certified. Yeah. And so how many years you work at Fort Myers Middle? So take me, take me through your, um, my career? trajectory okay. through the system. Yeah. Um, Fort Myers Middle that year. And I think many other schools had a huge drop in enrollment. So poor Louise Hollins had to call me in that year and say, um, we're going by seniority. And I said, Hey, I get it. I have seven months. You can't keep me. And I said, I I've already got another job. I went over to Michigan Montessori. They, they had, it's called surplusing. And, and 13 of us were surplused from Fort Myers Middle. And she was very sorry to have to do it, but she had to. I mean, she went by seniority. Mm -hmm. And so I went over to, um, it's a very short story, actually. I went over to, Fort, uh, to Michigan Montessori, which was a K to eight. And I taught eighth grade English. And then Mr. Burnside came to present to our eighth graders about how wonderful Dunbar was. And I thought, I want to work for this guy. And I went and applied for an English teaching job at Dunbar the next year. And most of my career has been at Dunbar High School. I had a few years at Fort Myers High School when our daughter was there. And then I went back to Dunbar. I was briefly at Island Coast waiting for the Dunbar job, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> what you, so your daughter went to Fort Myers High? She has an IB diploma from Fort Myers High School. What year did she graduate? 24, 2010, sorry, 2010. Oh, I graduated from there in 08. Did you it, really? Yeah. I don't so, remember. I don't, I don't were, you ever her, in youth in, were you ever in youth and government? No. You, um, okay, so I was the uh, sponsor for youth and government when okay. I was there. Maybe that's why you look so familiar. I'm sure I saw you 2008, there. <laughs> and in 2007... I was at Fort Myers High when I won the Golden Apple. Okay. So you would have been in yeah, your 11th. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm sure, now that I'm thinking you about it. You would have been it, in yeah. your senior year. Isn't that yeah. funny? That's great. <laughs> um, all right. So you've been at Dunbar since what year? So I was at Dunbar 2003 to 2006. Okay. And then I've been there again since 2011. Okay. And so you're the reading coach uh -huh. there. What, what does the reading coach do? A reading coach has to be a jack of all trades. And my main job right now is helping seniors who need the concordant score. So I... I what is that? that the, the score for graduation okay. in reading. We have um, uh, students who come to the United States not speaking English mm -hmm. primarily. I think we have um, about four... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to estimate 100 of them are seniors. Um, and so they need a lot of help learning English mm -hmm. so they can reach the level that Florida expects for reading. My job is to help kids go make gains in reading, and I do that by working primarily with teachers. Reading coaches in the school district of Lee County are all like me. We are hard workers who go into and work with our teachers as hard as we can to raise the district graduation rate. Mm -hmm. Anything it takes, if that's teaching 10th graders to write short responses, or if it's teaching 12th graders how to grammar and commas, 
so they can pass the SAT. That's what I do. Yeah. And if you want to learn more about the International Center, is the, the program, it's what they call it at Dunbar High School. We did a story on it, like I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast. If you uh, can, you can go to our YouTube channel and subscribe if you're not uh, a subscriber to our YouTube channel. The story is called International Success. So check it out if you want to learn a little bit more uh, about what that program is like. But So you work with a lot of students who um, were born in. Uh, another country and then yep. they move to the United States and a lot of them don't speak English. And so what, how would you describe the, the attitude of, of these students that you work with and maybe some of the, you know, the challenges in, in working with them? I will tell you this. I think one of the best things we have at our school is the International Center. And I couldn't agree with you more that people need to look at that video. It is a fantastic representation of what we do, and I thank you for that. You and your crew did a great job. Appreciate that. Thank you. Really. And what I find, and every teacher who works with these children will tell you the same, they are the hardest working, most devoted kids you would ever choose to work with. They, are, they want to learn English. They work very hard, and it's miraculous. Think about if you went to Japan as a 15 year old. And by in two years, you have to learn Japanese to read at almost a college level to graduate. That would be an impossible mission for me. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, let's pick France even. Let's pick a, a country that has similar, um, a similar alphabet, France or Spain. I would be hard pressed to learn enough Spanish to graduate in two years. Yeah. And these kids do, they are hard workers. They go to every tutoring offered. It is the really, truly rewarding. The other point I'd like to make is that we have many students at Dunbar who come into high school with reading deficits. And it, it's not just Dunbar. It's every school I've ever worked in. And I cannot emphasize enough that kids who grow up below the poverty level need enrichment with reading. Mm. And we provide that. Very much so. And um, what is it about what you do that you find rewarding? That I do? Yeah. Well, I just had it happen this morning. A student showed me their, their score in reading, that they're going to graduate. They will probably be the first person in their family to get a high school diploma, I'm guessing. That young man is now going to have a diploma. It's very rewarding. But I think any teacher would tell you it's more than rewarding. It is like an addiction. You get so excited for these kids, you can't really get enough of it. And I, I think um, the students keep me coming back. They really do. So do, do you only work with um, immigrant students or students in the, in, in the international center or, or all I students? I work with every yeah. student. Actually, every teacher in our school is my responsibility if they have kids who need to pass reading to graduate. We, uh, the, the, the new uh, reading test is very challenging, and, um, and we, our kids have trouble passing it. I work with the teachers. I do not work with the kids who can read, to be quite honest, who can read strongly, who, who are kids who can pass the FSA. Maybe all, I, I never interact with the kids in our technology department, mm -hmm. except to say hi in the hallway. Mm -hmm. My job is to enrich the reading level of children who need it to graduate. So do you work with them one-on-one? -on -one? No. No. I primarily, I do uh, what's called pull-out tutoring mm -hmm. with the seniors and with the juniors because they're so close to their deadline. With the ninth and 10th grade, I work with the teachers. I go into the classrooms and help the teachers. And I also go to what we call professional learning com communities. And I work with them in their professional learning communities. We have monthly reading coach meetings, and I take that information back to my school, to the teachers. Mm -hmm. um, anything else that you are working on at Dunbar or just anything else about Dunbar High School generally that, that you really want people out there to know about? Well, I think people need to know that um, we do have a technology center, and uh, we, have a, we are a Microsoft school. And the one thing I love to tell people, because people don't know this, we have several national and now, and, and at least one 
world champion in Microsoft competition. And those students go on to MIT and other, we have one at MIT now. These are students who go on to fabulous scholarships. We have a whole sector of our school that is provides students with um, certifications that would cost any adult $20,000. Kids graduate and go on to jobs in technology that you and I would envy. They're fabulous. Well, maybe I would envy, maybe. Not you. You have a great job, <laughs> financially. Uh, what? Uh, anything else before we move on? We can move on. Okay, so I just want to end it. Uh, I like to do five kind of a like a speed round kind of and i noticed that in your email signature that at the bottom it says i'm reading a certain you know a book and then it asks what are you reading so you're a big reader i'm assuming i'm a big <laughs> reader i i think it, reading is how you become a better reader mm -hmm. and in fact Helps I, the vocabulary i look for three words a week that i don't know mm -hmm. and try and learn them i read the new york times uh magazine and they always have words in there that and it would surprise you, mm -hmm. uh, the words that they use that you don't know. So what is your favorite book? Oh, that's a great book, The Color Purple. No, mm -hmm. no, no, no hesitation. The Color Purple, it, it, to me, was one of the most moving books I've ever read. I do, a close second is the book I'm reading right now, Becoming by Michelle Obama. Okay. It is so beautifully written and so down to earth. I recommend it. Yeah, I've seen it on all the best-selling charts. Mm -hmm. And so, what is your favorite movie? Oh, Color, my, the Color Purple. Uh, no, <laughs> no, I didn't really like that. I thought it was a. I didn't like the movie as much. Okay, so you have to know that I, when I watch movies, I really, really want to relax. So, uh, I mean, you're going to be really surprised. Lethal Weapon Four. <laughs> <laughs> I when I, I really love those movies. Um, I also really, um, I, I, you know, I'm going to tell you, I don't watch movies that much. Um, and I, there was a movie that just came out that I really, sorry to pause it's here. Okay. What's the one I, um, with the green characters? I'm so sorry. I should know this. It came out about five years ago. Oh, and it's all digital. It, it's all animated. And all, it's all digital. You can cut this from the podcast, you poor thing. <laughs> thank you. Oh, they're blue. Avatar. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I really like that movie. You can tell I don't get out much. <laughs> I'm a real reader. What can I say? <laughs> um, what's your favorite song or favorite musical group or artist? Oh, man. This is really a good question. I'm glad you didn't prep me. Um, I like Daddy Yankee. And I really love the blend of rigatone with English. And, um, you know, Desposito was such a hit. Yeah. I went to Kyrgyzstan. Our daughter's in the Peace Corps. And I went to Kyrgyzstan to visit her, my husband and I. And all the kids there that summer were singing Desposito. I love, um, I don't necessarily like the way some, some of the direction toward women that sure. goes on. Yeah. But the beat and the dance is great. Yeah. Sometimes you can just yeah. tune out the, uh, the, the lyrics. lyrics. Uh, and they're, some of them are in Spanish, so I'm okay. Yeah. Uh, growing up in, in grade school, what was your favorite subject? My favorite subject was French. French. Yes, I really enjoyed French. Um, my least favorite was art. I do believe I drew one picture for all of my, all of my school career. Um, but uh, I loved um, learning French and the, what it does to you to learn a new language is it, and to practice a new language is it teaches you humility. Like you might think you're all that, you try and get by with a with a new language, and and feel how how you have to push the envelope. Mm -hmm. I love that part of French, and of course in Canada it's a huge plus. Yeah, are you fluent? No, I'm not. No. I would be if I lived there long enough. Yeah. You do need immersion to be fluent. Mm -hmm. And last one: if you could have dinner with anyone, living or dead, who would it be and why? Oh, let me think for a minute now. Yeah, I know I'm putting you on the spot. No, you're not. You're it's okay. It's just so many. I I mean, I would love to sit with Shakespeare. I would love to sit with Shakespeare and find out what he thinks, all that goes on. I did go 
um, to uh, the town. Um, it's escaping me that he's from. I went to England, went to his town, walked around, went to Anne Hathaway's home, and they were very interesting people. And I would love to ask him or his wife, Anne Hathaway, what they think of all the attention they get in this modern world still. Mm, yeah. Uh, all right. Do you have a favorite work by him? I do. I really like um, the uh, Love's Labor's Lost. Mm. I think it's very good. I also like, um, I saw um, a really, King Lear. I went to King Lear and was it was a fabulous production and really enjoyed it. It's a bit of a downer, but I did enjoy it. <laughs> well, yeah, a lot of his are kind of downers. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. Patty Love Rock, reading coach Dunbar High School. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Adam. Take right. care. And thank you for watching and listening. We'll see you next time.